Our next speaker is Nir Sapir, who will be discussing community <coughs> fruit bats beneficially modulate their flight in relation to wind. Uh, thank you. Go for it. Yeah, I, the title changed a bit over time, but uh, um, first I would like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of all uh, my uh, um, uh, co-authors. And Nir Horvitz, who is a, a computational ecologist, uh, Jakob Farr and, and Dina Detman, who are basically bat uh, uh, people, and Martin Wikelski, who was the priest in this marriage. Um, so uh, I'm uh, uh, happy to introduce the straw-colored um, fruit bat. It is, uh, I think, a wonderful creature. Um, it lives in very large roosts, so the particular roost that we followed um, was, I think, 100,000 individuals, but they get up to uh, 10 million, I think. Martin, you're welcome to correct me. <laughs> um, so they get con very large concentrations of bats uh, in, in the sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and the motivation for the study was uh, that these huge roosts are down there. And we know that these bats are going away in the evening and returning at some stage in the morning or midnight. But nobody knew what's happened in between. Nobody knew where they're going, when, what condition they encounter along the way. So this was the, the motivation, or at least some of the motivation for this uh, particular study. And we, uh, uh, the field workers, uh, uh, Dina and Yaakov, put uh, tags on, on these bats. And eventually, um, this is what we got. We got uh, tracks going from uh, the roost area to uh, outside to, to the forest. And this is how a, a typical um, a track uh, look like. So uh, this is a bat goes back to the roosting place. It is found fairly low over ground, about 100 to 200 meters. And it is going in a fairly straight line overall, but it does sometimes, some of the bats tend to do some uh, crazy things once in a while. So um, for example, this bat here um, suddenly took some kind of a, I don't know, swivel root and, and decided that uh, uh, he needs to maybe to explore the, the environment and made uh, some kind of a, of a strange loop over there. But most of the tracks are pretty much straight going from the roof to, uh, to feeding sites. And these feeding sites are fairly constant, so they are specific. The bat is going from one place from the roost area to the feeding site and then returns to the same feeding site night after night. So um, let's go back. Yeah, so, um, so this is the, the, the result that we had from the tracking of the bats in the field. And we wanted to, make, to, to try and make sense out of it uh, by asking several uh, questions. And uh, we know that, sorry, we know that, um, that the basic idea is to ask, or, or the most simple fundamental question that Martin asks is how they do it. What are the factors that affect their movement and how come they are able to reach their goal night after night without any um, obvious problem? So. Oops, again. So um, we know that they have specific feeding sites, and they had a, a site faithful, faithfulness overall. And we wondered what happened with the wind. They are obviously encountering different kinds of wind along the way. What they, what we don't know anything about their behavior when they encounter crosswinds that may shift them uh, sideways. And we don't know if they change their own speed in relation to the air. So the, maybe the, the bigger question here is, do bats fly in an optimal manner? Whether they are responding optimally to their environment. And this might have some important consequences on their fitness. So 
in terms of the theoretical background, we uh, uh, know that when bats encounter side wind, they may be drifted sideways, and in which case they will have positive correlation between their track and the, the wind vector. A different solution, which might be uh, more optimal, would be to compensate, which means that when the bat have a, a, a wind coming through, um, it will uh, change its heading and go towards the incoming wind so that its overall track will be towards its destination. And in this case, we expect no correlation between the wind vector and the bat um, track vector. So uh, another important issue is the wind, the type of the wind and the distribution of the winds along the track. So in this particular paper, it was suggested that bats may do two different things depending on the wind. When the winds are constant, they should compensate all the way along the route. Um, and when the winds are changing from side to side, then only when they are getting close to their destination, they should correct their um, overall direction and go straight to their feeding site or their roost. We know that there are some empirical studies um, that tend to, uh, to support either predictions. And there's one study in bees that uh, actually uh, documented compensation uh, for winds, for side wind. Um, but in most cases, um, there are unknown wind conditions and lack of entire and detailed tracks to enable us to actually do this kind of analysis. Um, the second thing that we wanted to ask was whether tail or, or tailwinds affect the, uh, the, the bats and we used the theoretical framework uh, developed by Colin Pennyquick um, to predict that there will be a negative effect of tailwind on the airspeed, which is a bit um, counterintuitive maybe, but I will try to explain it with this um, uh, figure. So what's happened is that when the uh, bat is experiencing a favorable wind, um, the calculation of optimal flight suggests that it should reduce its energy investment in flight because it gets pushed already. So it can save energy. And it is vice versa for headwinds because when the bat is, is experiencing more headwind, it should increase its own airspeed in order to uh, overcome the wind that is, 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 is going through. So this is the general idea. So when there are um, uh, headwinds, uh, which are denoted here by the, uh, by the uh, red line, um, we should expect a higher airspeed. So the overall uh, uh, correlation that we expect to see is negative. Okay, so tailwind, so a, a stronger tailwind means that the bat will decrease its own airspeed. So for that, we know that there are many, many uh, studies, uh, mostly in birds, but some in insects that actually support this. And this is overall widely accepted. But there are no bat studies at all that study, uh, that examine this particular uh, theory in the wild. Lastly, um, we are uh, also wanting to know what happened when birds encounter crosswind. So we know that the effect of crosswind is similar to that of headwinds, which means that the bat should increase its own airspeed when encountering crosswind. So it increases its own speed, meaning that it reduces the relative strength of the crosswind. Okay, so it, it, it is have its own higher body uh, speed, and the relative magnitude of crosswind is reduced. So we can see here this combined theoretical um, tailwind and crosswind uh, expectation, meaning that in, in uh, uh, low angles, tailwind conditions, the bat is expected to decrease its own speed. But then when uh, uh, wind changes to crosswind and to headwind, 
the relationship reverses and the bat is expected to increase its own speed. So we know that this has been tested in birds twice and there was no empirical support for this kind of uh, relationship. And there, this is, these are the only studies that ever uh, tested this particular theory. So these are the research questions that we uh, tackled in this particular uh, study. So the first one is crosswind compensation. The second one is uh, changes in airspeed in relation to tailwind assistance. And the third one are the modulation of the airspeed according to crosswind speed. So, straw-colored fruit bats were tagged in the field uh, using EOBS uh, uh, transmitters. So, they were released near the colony and were just uh, flying around with their uh, mates and, and, and all other uh, bats that were at this time in, in, this, the, in the colony. And the tags were, uh, the data from the tags was uh, uh, downloaded a day or several days later uh, within the, the, the colony using radio transmission. And the bats were just freely roaming, going away, and it doesn't, the, the tag didn't seem to have any discernible effect on their behavior, as far as we could tell. We, uh, an, we, we ran some uh, simulation of atmospheric uh, data, uh, wind data, in order to uh, track the motion of the, uh, of the atmosphere um, throughout the journey. So we divided it to two different scales. One is the scale of the journey, which could last it for an hour or two. And the, the second is, are the actual rate of GPS acquisition. Um, so it was a five minutes in most cases. In two tags, we had two and a half minutes. And we modeled the, the, the data, the atmospheric data. We matched it spatially and temporally uh, to the actual track of the bat. So the results. Um, first, regarding uh, wind drift compensation. So these are the two hypotheses that uh, we had. And uh, we uh, uh, looked at the data and saw that there was no correlation whatsoever between crosswind speed and sideways speeds. And we wanted to check if this relates to different segments along the way. For example, there will, there's this uh, prediction that the bats will only compensate at the end of their journey. So um, we couldn't find this particular effect. We actually found the opposite, that bat drifted at the end of the journey and were actually uh, compensating for wind at the start of the journey, which is a bit counterintuitive. But then uh, this study that was published uh, half a year ago suggested si similar thing for optimal um, animals that need to cross uh, an area with uh, a cross flow. This was uh, actually developed for sea turtles and for boats initially. Um, I'm not really 100% sure that this is actually what happened. It has some assumptions that I don't think operate here. So we need to look further into it and maybe do some simulations in order to test it more rigorously um, with, with the data that we have. But this is an interesting option. Um, regarding our second prediction, uh, we did find that there is a negative uh, correlation between bat airspeed and tailwind speed in both time scale, in the two time scales. So the analysis overall supports uh, our prediction. Um, and with regard to the third prediction, um, we did find that there were changes that were uh, fairly consistent uh, at different segments of, uh, uh, of, this, of the wind direction. So a tailwind, which is the leftmost um, panel, there was a decrease in the bat's own airspeed, and there was an increasing trend of 
of, uh, of increase in, in the bat's airspeed with uh, a wind speed at the different sections so that it all uh, came out uh, like, uh, like you see here on the left panel. So we can see there is a general agreement that at one stage the bats shift their overall behavior from reducing their own air wing uh, airspeed air towards uh, when conditions are of tailwind support to increasing their own uh, airspeed when conditions are of headwind. So the overall analysis supports prediction three and this is new in bats but also in all other studies published so far. So we found some non-trivial wind drift uh, compensation that still needs to be explained and explored. Um, the response to tail and crosswind seems optimal, or at least seems to conform with theoretical expectations. Um, we did find something which uh, may indicate the rule that bats actually um, use. So bat ground speed was nearly constant regardless of tailwind assistance, which means that this might be an adaptive thumb rule. They use possibly this kind of rule to uh, make uh, a near optimal decisions reg with regard to the flow. Um, and this is uh, uh, pretty much encouraging because we, we made some preliminary analysis, similar analysis of bats also in Israel, fruit bats in Israel, and they seem to use the same general rule. Um, next, we, we would be interested to make some uh, comparative response or comparative analysis with other bat populations around the world and explore more into the biomechanical, biomechanical basis of movement, energetics, and kinematics uh, of the movement in order to explore whether variation in the response to wind are biomechanically based. Thank you very much. Yes, Tom. I'm wondering, this is related to the fixed ground speed. You, can you separate the data based on the moon phase or the, or the amount of moonlight they have? Because they're adjusting their ground speed. They must respond to the signal from the ground, visual signal from the ground. And I mm -hmm. think that means that that might vary with the amount of intermittent light they have available. Yes, I think that this, this could be done, especially since there are more tracks now, I think, from other places. But I suspect that they actually can see even when there's no moonlight around. So they might have enough um, information available for them, even in relatively dark conditions. Thank you. Thank you.